Okay, well, many of you probably know Alex, so he doesn't need an introduction, but uh, for some, I'll give you a little background. Uh, Alex is actually from Bellingham, Washington, which is about as far away as you can be from here and still be in the continental uh, United States. Uh, uh, pretty close on the Canadian border. In fact, he has dual citizenship, so he kind of has a built-in escape plan if necessary. Uh, Alex attended Western Washington University, uh, where he did his undergraduate work at the Huxley College of the Environment under Wayne Landis, who is a bit of a legend in our field of environmental toxicology. Uh, in fact, the environmental science program that he was involved in setting up at the Huxley uh, school is one of the first in the country with a strong toxicology emphasis uh, for undergraduates. And we even used it as a bit of a model for, excuse me, for setting up some of our courses here at ENST. Uh, Dr. Bowerman spotted Alex at a national meeting of the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, I believe in Portland, if that's correct. Presenting uh, Long Beach. Excuse me? Oh, Long, Long Beach, Beach of course. Yeah. Uh, presenting his, some of his undergraduate graduate research. Uh, and thought he would be a pretty good uh, candidate for graduate study and introduced us. And, and he certainly wasn't mistaken in that. Uh, at that point, Alex joined my lab as a master's student where he started doing work studying endocrine disruption in regional largemouth bass. I uh, completed that work with a nice publication and decided to continue on for a PhD. Along the way, Alex has had the opportunity to work very closely with colleagues from a variety of federal agencies, US EPA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, uh, and maybe most especially US uh, Geological Survey, as well as folks at Maryland DNR and DC Department of Energy and the Environment and Virginia DEQ and, and a number of others. Uh, and he's managed to build sort of a team of, of experts in this region that have gone a very long way to facilitate his research. Uh, and in fact, several are serving as members on his committee from his first CTAC meeting as an undergraduate, Alex has become a very active member of the society. He served as the president of the North American student chapter uh, and even served as a voting member of the society's board of directors. Uh, through all of this, he's made an awful lot of sort of powerful contacts. So I'm, I'm uh, comfortable once he finishes up here and moves on, he's gonna have plenty of opportunities to consider. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to have Alex share his dissertation research. Thank you very much, Lance. Um, so I was actually going to give a little bit of background on myself just to start out because I considered uh, just going straight into the research, but uh, considering I will have my defense in the next several months, sometime yet to be scheduled, um, and that will be open to the public and that will be purely research-based, I was going to kind of give you a bit of my story for the first bit and then get into the research. And I didn't realize Lance would say all the things he did um, because it took a little bit of the wind out of my sails, but that's okay. Um, so I'm still going to go ahead and uh, cover some of uh, just the, I wrote down a little bit of my story just to kind of tell everyone because I feel like uh, half the people probably know it and the other half don't. So I just want to start from the beginning and uh, give you a little bit of background and then we'll get into the research. So I want to thank all of you for uh, joining me for my PhD exit seminar. I want to note that I still have a PhD defense on the books or to put on the books where I will really get into the science and everyone will be invited that are on this call. Um, so I'm going to talk about my story and then I plan to interweave the research that I've engrossed myself in for the last four to five years so sit back, relax, and for my horde of family and friends on the West Coast, enjoy your morning coffee. And for those of you on the East Coast, please feel free to enjoy your lunch while I take you on this uh, journey that I've been going through. Um, I hope you enjoy and thanks again for coming. So growing up, I never planned or expected to go to graduate school probably because no one in my immediate family had done anything like it and it just didn't seem like an option. And that wasn't a bad thing. It just didn't seem like something I'd be good at or I'd enjoy. I graduated high school way back in 2006 from a tiny high school with about 115 other graduates in a sleepy border town, Blaine, not Bellingham, but that's fine, um, which is situated on the border of British Columbia and the Pacific Ocean. 
Some of you may know that I am a born Canadian and dual citizen. And with few prospects on the US side of the border, I ventured into Canada and I spent my first couple years out of high school working in the movie industry in Vancouver, British Columbia. Notably, I'm in the credits for Alien vs. Predator Requiem, just a background thing. Um, it was a harsh job. I worked 15 hour days um, with the occasional interesting experience. Between movie and TV gigs, I also work uh, commercial roofing in Canada with my brother. And one day when I was on the set of Dr. Doolittle's four and five, which went straight to video and no Eddie Murphy was not involved. Um, I was chatting with one of the crew and I was told that if I had any inkling of going to college, that I should just do it now while I was young because I could always come back. And that was the best advice I could get at the time because at that moment, either I would double down and join the Director's Guild, cementing my future in the movie industry. I took that conversation seriously and took the money I had earned and immediately enrolled in community college with no idea of really what I would study. So I started with the basics, math, science, English, knowing that I could use those courses for any degree. And my perspective was try to go as far as I could. And whenever it got too difficult or I wasn't liking it, I would pull off there and choose a degree that I could complete with those courses. Well, I went far enough that I had options and environmental science sounded like something I could really enjoy. Not knowing what it really was, except I'd probably get to work in nature. And that was important to me. Um, during this time, I began working from full, I have to full time in restaurants, starting as a cook and eventually doing just about every other job over the years. This was all while living at home with my father to make this venture economically feasible. And when I transferred to Western Washington University, I took on more hours to cover the increase in expenses and did not realize that organic chemistry would require so much dedication. So that first quarter, I nearly flunked out and was just about to give up when my buddy Ed told me I was just working too much and to give it another chance. I was still unsure about what I would study. And while I was leaving campus on a beautiful sunny spring day that semester with a couple hours to spare before going to the restaurant to serve, a former classmate saw me from across the quad and called me over. He said that he was about to attend this scientific seminar and they were walking to a new room because so many people had come to see this person speak. I was set on taking some time to relax by late padding before work when he convinced me to come and listen, so I did. That was the inflection point in my academic career. I listened as this passionate speaker, better yet, this scientific orator, gave a stunning speech about his research on an herbicide known as atrazine and its potential to cause frogs to become her hermaphrodites while making them infertile. Now, some of you may know who I'm talking about, no other than the controversial and powerful speaker, Dr. Tyrone Hayes. I told my friend, the friend who invited me that I was blown away and what is this field called? He said, it is environmental toxicology and Huxley has a great program that he had enrolled in. That was it, I knew exactly what I would dedicate my future exploits to, environmental toxicology. Now on academic probation, I started the following semester warily, but excited since I had been accepted into Huxley College of Environment, which allowed me to enroll in the course. It had a lecture and a lab component, and this course solidified my direction and gave me a passion I could dedicate myself to and pursue wholeheartedly. And on the bright side of my GPA reflected that. In the second of these courses, we were put into teams and had to design our own research project based on the scientific literature. And then we were pushed to present our research at a regional scientific conference, the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, or CTAC. For the first time, I witnessed scientific discourse in real time, 
And it made me realize that this was truly what I wanted to do for the rest of my career. Some of the folks I met that momentous occasion, such as Wendy Hill Walker, became my first mentor and still is. From there, I reached out to Wayne Landis, who directed the Institute of Environmental Toxicology within Huxley, who gave me the opportunity to conduct my own research as part of a senior thesis, where I investigated mixtures of pesticides with small invertebrates that lived in the water. When I graduated in 2012, I struggled finding a job and I worked that summer in construction as part of a three-man crew building custom homes while searching for jobs. That far, fall was the SeaTac National Meeting in Long Beach, which I had never attended. I submitted my research and was accepted. Now I needed some funding to finance the trip. Luckily, I had uh, I have a supportive and courageous father who gave me a small loan and my undergraduate advisor, Wayne Landis, helped chip in the rest. I went in prepared. My dad said, fake it to you make it and pushed me to get business cards printed, which I thought was ridiculous for someone in my position. Um, but I did it anyways. And I definitely overdressed wearing a black on black pinstripe suit. And I was terrified, but I had a mission. Those who know me since grad school know me as being quite open and happy to chat, but at that time I was quite shy and presentations I gave in undergrad shook me to the bone. I remember giving a three minute speech where my voice trembled uncontrollably and sweat trickled down my face. This is when all that changed. I spent the first three days of the conference chatting to every business represented at the conference in hopes of finding a job. By the last day of the conference, I had my poster for, to present. And all that week I had been told, thanks, but sorry, we are not hiring right now. I was devastated and my high hopes were quickly fleeting, but I forced myself to stand by my poster that entire day, skipping all the talks. And as anyone who has attended a scientific conference knows, this is the absolute worst day to present since half the people have left and everyone else is burned out. Still, I did not leave my poster. And to my surprise, I was greeted by two gentlemen who were chatting and perusing the posters. And one of them happened to be my current department chair, uh, Bill Bowerman. After I gave my spiel, he told me I should go to graduate school. I replied, that sounds great, but I can't afford it. And he replied that it would be fully funded and he had the perfect advisor for me. This absolutely blew my mind and I immediately began conversing with who has now been my advisor since 2013, Dr. Yankus. Um, and in no time I found myself flying across the country to the University of Maryland with two suitcases in hand and my backpacking pack on my back. This was the first time I had left home and only my second time visiting the East Coast. During my master's, I studied laparoscopic surgery and largemouth bass to detect a condition known as intersex. And I have to say, after writing the proposal, I was terrified to actually apply this technique, considering I had only researched these small bugs in water and never worked with fish. And I think my advisor was similarly framed at the idea, even though we had both conversed on the subject for many hours, but we pushed forward and we did it. It was an incredible experience and pushed me outside my comfort in every way I could imagine. By the end of my master's, I was interested in pursuing a PhD with Lance since we had such a good, great working relationship and I loved our conversa conversations, which would often go on for hours, um, potentially to his wife's dismay, dismay some evenings. My master's committee suggested studying reproductive health of yellow perch in the Chesapeake Bay. And after reading a paper they had published in 2013, ironically the year I started my master's, I thought this is a subject that deserves some intense investigation. And so I got to work and decided that if I'm going to pursue a PhD, I would do all the things that interested me and especially those things that I expected I wouldn't get to do in the future unless I went into academia, which wasn't very high on my list. I knew I wanted new experiences and to add to my tool set, 
So we put together the best committee I could ask for with expertise in genetics, aquatic toxicology, and fish histopathology, which I promise I will soon get to. Um, in the meantime, I had another goal near and dear to my heart, and that was to serve my professional family, CTAP. I had already served on multiple national committees and as a student representative for our regional chapter for the last couple of years. My final goal, along with pursuing a PhD, was to chair the North America Student Advisory Council, or NASAC, which governs student involvement and activities across North America within the society. This was an elected position and required a three-year commitment and attendance on multiple conferences, conference calls every month. This was a career building experience and more gratifying than I could have imagined. As part of the commitment, I also served as a student voice on the board of directors where I learned how the society really functioned and how important volunteers are to the functioning of the society. My, major, my two major accomplishments were furthering our effort to give the students in the society the right to vote in the general election, which we did and creating a speed dating style event for students to meet with representatives from industry, academia, and government to get a better idea of the avenues available after graduation, which honestly I wanted for myself. So it was a bit selfish, but I figured everyone else would enjoy it too. Finally, as the North American delegate, I was sent to SeaTac Europe, which was in Rome that year. And this was my first and only experience outside of North America and was an undeniably uh, one of the best experiences of my life. In addition, I helped with the first two entirely student run CTAC meetings known as Young Environmental Scientists or YES in North America. It had currently been running for several years in Europe only. This was an opportunity for students to learn how to run every facet of a scientific conference. It also had the goal of involving students from around the world. We held our first meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, and the second one in Waco, Texas, which happened to be the first week of March last year when the pandemic was just taking off. Luckily, no one got COVID, so it all worked out. All of these experiences have allowed me to meet other like-minded scientists from around the world expand my worldview and create lasting friendships that I could have never formed if I had only focused on the research in grad school. I have to thank Lance for his continued support throughout all of these endeavors. I don't think many advisors would be too happy with the amount of time this endeavor required. And I can't say how grateful I am for all of those opportunities. Okay, I've taken up enough time talking about my story. And so now I'll get into the research and what I've actually been doing outside of all of those other activities. So thank you for all for coming. Um, as you can see on this title page, um, I'm studying the reproductive health of yellow perch um, from Chesapeake Bay tributaries. And I'm looking at uh, the reproductive health through uh, genetics, specifically transcriptomics. I'm looking at hormones and histopathology. And so I'll move on to our next slide. Um, if I can, yeah. So I borrowed a couple of slides from a colleague at Maryland DNR. Um, and she just had shown when we gave a presentation together, some of the early photos of, uh, for instance, this is the Severn River um, and fishing in there mid 1900, or, yeah, around, I think around 1950s. And so you can see that it was a huge, uh, a huge fishing uh, for recreational and commercial at that time. Um, the Severn River was actually used as an incubation area for a lot of the uh, yellow perch that would be distributed throughout the region, showing that it was a highly productive system and uh, that uh, things quickly changed. In the 1980s, uh, the fishery started to show declines. By 89, managers closed a lot of the rivers, especially on the western shore. Um, and then 
In 97, there was an increased catch by anglers. And so an investigation was initiated to see if the populations were recovering since uh, the fisheries had been closed for the most part for so long. Um, and uh, Anne Arundel County, um, the Sever and Severn River Commission, they identified some threats that could be contributing to these issues with the reproduction. Um, and those include sedimentation, which can uh, essentially coat the eggs and uh, prevent oxygen from getting to the eggs. Um, increased nutrients, which increases algal blooms, which can cause similar effects, blocking out sunlight and other aspects and decreasing dissolved oxygen. Um, and then contaminants were a potential input, although the major uh, sources would be more uh, diffuse, like uh, septic fields and other things like that, not a big wastewater treatment plant necessarily, something that you could point at. And the other issues were temperatures. It's a smaller watershed, so it gets, the quicker you develop the watershed, the quicker uh, conditions can change. And then uh, low oxygen, which is major, especially when the eggs are hatching in those initial stages, which is about right now um, that this is happening. Um, so this is just to show that uh, out of the rivers that they studied for this, uh, the Severn River was uh, consistently lower in dissolved oxygen um, across the different stations um, compared to, uh, as well as the South and, uh, and uh, South River, I mean, sorry, South and yeah, these three top rivers are all on the Western shore. So they have these smaller watersheds that are more developed and the Wacomico is on the eastern shore, which is more agricultural. And you can see the major difference in dissolved oxygen that they measured back then. And during my study, this is a big table, but I just kind of bolded salinity. Um, dissolved oxygen, I didn't do bottom. It was the upper layers. It didn't seem too bad. But during these different occasions, you can see the salinity is much higher. And really, the eggs have been shown to not tolerate much more than two parts per thousand of salinity. So these are kind of concerning numbers uh, just for the egg viability in the stream. And you can see that the chop tank and Matter Woman, they are much lower, um, which for salinity, that's really crucial for the egg development. Um, this is a little bit of a historical uh, diagram showing just as on the y-axis as the percentage of impervious surface, so essentially the amount of land that's been paved or covered that is no longer forested or just wild, as that increases, it, uh, there's a correlation between the fisheries declining and uh, all of those different issues with egg hatch and hypoxia and other aspects. It's not necessarily saying that it's the reason for it happening, but it at least is a good indicator to show uh, how the fish are responding. And so that goes all the way up to 2013, um, which is really when the last bit of research has been done, really up to 2009. So um, from now on, these are all my personal slides. Those were uh, courtesy of Margaret McGinty and John Upoff at Maryland DNR. So, as you can see, this timeline um, up until pretty much 2009, um, when they reopened the recreational fishery, partly because uh, it seemed like the fish were still there, even though the hatching issues were still the same and egg abnormalities had been noted in the study conducted in 2007 to 2009. Um, and even though uh, for recreational fisheries, they're not pulling out the number of fish that uh, commercial is, and they had uh, been banned for so long that they opened it up uh, to demand, and because it just, things weren't changing, it wasn't getting better, so it shouldn't hurt too much to have a bit of recreational, and at least the community's more involved. So, this was kind of an impetus for me seeing all these issues and we really didn't get to a place where we uh, had any idea of what might be going on. And so, and seeing that there was a major data gap between where I started and where the last study was conducted, I figured this would be a good topic to study. 
Um, unfortunately, that also means that there isn't much to go off for the the years between 2009 and 2017 uh, based off of just larval survival and other aspects because they just weren't really being monitored um, anymore. Um, so the, the impetus for this study was really this previous study, um, which was uh, conducted between 2007 and 2009. And they noted all these abnormalities within the eggs. And you can see in uh, uh, the letter C diagram, uh, this abnormal oocyte, which you can see the egg, uh, essentially the shell, the zona pellucida, that's covering it is very thin and has like these irregular edges compared to A, where it's a very thick layer, which is what you want because these eggs float on the river surface and they need to be buoyant and that needs to protect them until they hatch. So that seemed like an indicator that might be part of the reason why they weren't hatching, as well as in uh, diagram D, um, you can see these little droplets that were noted in the yolk, and it should be a essentially uniform. And this was just something that you weren't that seeing in places where the fish were doing well, and so that uh, might be indicative of also why they're not uh, surviving. Um, past the early life stages, considering the yolk contains everything for that fish to construct itself. You need every bit of uh, protein and lipid and uh, all the genetic information to cause that rapid transformation because these are fertilized outside of the body. So once they're spawned, it's like you need everything in there ready to go. Um, so this really uh, pushed this was really the reason for me to start this study. And some of the considerations I came up with, which might have to do with some of these issues um, was timing. Um, it's really important because these fish are the first spawners of the year. So everything has to happen in a rapid succession. Um, and so I considered gene expression would be something that might tell me if something's off. Uh, that connects to the hormones because those genes might be are responsible for creating those hormones and releasing and receptors and all of that. And then ultimately the tissue changes, what's happening like in those last photos I showed um, at the cellular level, are all of these things happening at the right time and can I identify that? And the responses, so the hormones in the blood have to fl fluctuate enough to trigger these different responses. So that's part of why I measured those. Um, and then do all these things make sense, which is a difficult thing to actually say, especially when I'm working in the wild and you don't have any way to truly control your scenario other than use another reference river, which doesn't have the same attributes as these rivers. So it's, it's difficult. Um, so some of the things that could have been forming those oocyte abnormalities, oocyte is the egg essentially before it's been fertilized and such. Um, so these are some of the things that I came up with um, just the gene expression for the hormones specifically, it's dysregulated or the receptors um, that the release of the hormones isn't happening at the right time or the right amount, or that's just not interacting with the tissue properly because the receptors and everything aren't set up in a way to properly do that. And finally, maybe it's even after seeing those photos of the yolk and, uh, those abnormalities, maybe there's contaminants that are being passed on from the mother to the to the egg, just like they in the Pacific Northwest with orca whales and them giving lethal body burdens of different contaminants to their offspring and sometimes killing them from it. So these were kind of different things that I hypothesized that could be affecting them. Um, and then there's a multitude of things that we haven't thought about or just didn't include in the study because the, you can go on forever. So the main objective was really to establish the sequence and time course of normal gonadal recrudescence. So the buildup of the gonad, all the early stages, the proliferation of the eggs, and then them being filled with all of that yolk to make them and all of those aspects. So looking at that, and hopefully that would help us 
determine if we see differences between some of these uh, more developed watersheds on the western shore compared to the eastern shore where it's more agricultural, more forested, um, also larger watersheds, which is something that makes the comparison a little bit more troublesome, but that's just what we have to work with. And so I'm trying to look at the molecular level all the way up to the organ level um, to these tissue changes to see if we can determine something. So for my experimental design, um, for those of you that aren't too familiar with the Chesapeake Bay, I've uh, put small yellow perch on the three different watersheds that we sampled. Um, so our design was to try to uh, catch the fish at the early stages of like follicular genesis where they're making all these eggs. Um, and then, uh, then into December, where you have the telegenesis, where they should be pumping the eggs, or at least, or already done a lot of that, pumping the eggs with the telegenin, which makes up that yolk. Um, and then in March, when they are spawning, so, or just before they spawn, we were trying to catch them like the week before, because they should be ready to go at that point. Um, and so we did that over two years, from 2017 to 2019, and across these three different rivers. So for yellow perch, they are triggered um, to spawn by two major indicators. So sunlight, so the photo period, the length of day as that increases, that starts to make them uh, start to gear up to spawn and temperature. So as the temperature rises, those two things together make them the first spawners of the spring in the Chesapeake Bay and they, are, uh, they start to run upstream. And so part of what I was looking at it, with that whole hormone and genetics aspect was I wanted to look at these important hormones that influence this whole process. And so two of these compounds that you see, so the hypothalamus in the brain sends a, a signal to the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone LH and follicle stimulating hormone FSH. And so those things need to happen at the right time for all of these processes, um, especially the final maturation aspect. Um, and then those go to the ovaries to tell them to make more eggs or to start loading up with telogenin or to get ready to spawn. Um, and there's a feedback loop with estrogen and progestogens um, to tell when to turn off those different things when everything's ready. So I tried to look at LH and FSH. They are very unique molecules across all vertebrates. So I wasn't, and I wasn't able to find a commercially available kit that could uh, detect it in yellow perch. I was able to find one for estrogen, partly because it's the same compound that humans have. It's shared across all invertebrates, so much easier to measure. So I got stuck with only that, unfortunately, but uh, it still helps tell some of the story. So just to kind of give you a visual uh, diagram of what I was doing, um, I have on the left gene expression. So the goal was to look at that pituitary gland in the brain, to look at the liver, which produces the proteins that fill that egg yolk, and then add the actual gonad, add the eggs within it. And then, so look at the genes that are being turned on and off and see if the timing is correct. Look at the histopathology, so look at the tissue cells under the microscope. And we looked at all of these different tissues, although some of these are more pertaining to my specific research and some are more general fish health indicators. And then to look at the plasma hormones and potentially proteins in the plasma, which we didn't get to. So um, overall, these are all the analyses and tissues and methods that I was going to use for this presentation. I'm only going to focus on gene expression, um, plasma hormones, and uh, tissue changes in the gonad. So for the sampling method, methods, uh, we use fike nets, which uh, hook onto the shoreline um, and you leave them out for a day. We use trawling and you can see a horde of white perch in that from the Chop Tank River. And we use electrofishing. Um, 
because no one ever tries to catch yellow perch really except for maybe some recreational anglers um, outside of the when they go to spawn because they're running upstream um, then it's it's actually very difficult to find them and as all the u.s fish and wildlife folks figured out along with me um, it is very difficult to find them sometimes which uh, sometimes require two to three weeks of effort and sometimes we still didn't catch the fish um, just because we couldn't find them so we put in a lot of effort um, to get to try to find them um, and some of these uh, occasions were quite fun and some of them were quite scary there was one point um, we're fishing in the winter for the most part and we uh, came up to a net and it had been filled with uh, fish. Every bit of the net, every uh, hoop within it were just packed with fish. And we had to jump out of the boat and start uh, digging through them because they were giant carp that were just filling them with huge spines. And the fish and wildlife folk were like, please uh, help us jump out. I'm like, I don't know what to do because I wasn't wearing proper boots for this, but it was catastrophic. We had to do something. So I jumped out and this is freezing cold water. So it was definitely naive and I should have probably spoke up, but I just didn't know what to do. And it was a panic. So I did it. Um, we probably spent close to 30 minutes to 45 minutes struggling in the mud, pulling out fish. Um, and before we went, we, and luckily we got all the fish we needed that day in that one net, but we still had several other nets set up and down the stream. So we had to go and release all those fish. We started boating down to the next site when I couldn't feel my feet at all and told them, I really think I need to go back. So they took me back to the truck. I sat with my feet over the heaters. They went and got the fish and um, after probably 30 minutes, I started to get feeling back and luckily I didn't lose my toes or anything, but I could tell I was very, very close to that happening. And after that, then I got back to the lab and met with USGS folks um, for us to start measuring, I mean, start dissecting the fish. This is just an image to show you kind of what the eggs look like. They come out as an egg chain, which is really unique to this species. And I'll have a couple other photos to show you of that. So these are some of the people that made this research possible. It wouldn't have been possible without them. Each day that we caught fish, that I caught fish with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, if I caught them, I would call up USGS they would start driving from West Virginia and they would come up and meet me and we would spend the next several hours uh, dissecting the fish and collecting uh, tissues as well as blood and everything else. And after that, I would go back to campus and I would spin down the blood and extract the plasma and save all that thing, all those tissues and start again the next day. Um, on the left, you can see that egg chain and uh, what it looks like and it's quite uh incredible because even like a couple weeks before the spawn if you if you look at the ovary the eggs haven't broken up they're still a hard i mean congealed mass um and suddenly they go through the final maturation steps which uh keeps them glued together in one direction and not in the other direction. So it can essentially spool out and then uh, float along in the river. And the reason why I focus mostly on the females is uh, the way they spawn, there's usually a dominant male that is alongside and is fertilizing the eggs as they come out, as well as a group of other males behind doing the same, um, hoping to fertilize some. So because it's this mass of males with each female, it seemed like if, if we're running into these issues with egg uh, viability, it was probably due to uh, the female more than the male. Um, so just to discuss the watershed land use, um, you can see the Chop Tank River, that's kind of my reference site. It's only 7% developed. It's mostly agricultural with some forests. 
Matter Woman's in the middle, Matter Woman Creek, and it has a lot of forest uh, around it, less ag. Um, and then Severn River is uh, 38%, so it's still not highly developed, but it's much more developed than all these other rivers and has a much smaller watershed, at least than the Choptank River. Um, this is just to give you a little bit of an indication of how many fish we were actually catching. Um, so this doesn't include the males, and, it, and you can see that on some of these occasions, we did not find any fish, even though we put in the same amount of effort um, across the board. So just a mess trying to collect the fish, period. And so for the transcripts tomic study, I looked at six individuals from the chop tank in 2019, 2018 and 2019, um, across uh, essentially all those three different stages of development. And then uh, we compared on in December and in March uh, between the two sites, the most extremes essentially, the chop tank and the Severn. Um, and each, uh, each sample, we obtained about 15 to 20 million reads and in total about 800 million reads, which turned out to be quite the bioinformatic challenge. Um, and these are some of the top uh, upregulated and downregulated genes, which were pretty strongly uh, upregulated or downregulated. If you look at the log two fold change or just the fold change, you can see um, those numbers, and that's showing the difference between the chop tank fish and the severn fish on the spawn. And a lot of these uh, different genes are to do with uh, the actual within the ovary, um, the eggs in preparation for the spawn. So. Um, I'm looking more into this as time goes on because it's just a lot of data to wade through. Um, I just figured out finally uh, doing pathway analysis. Um, and one of the pathways that was highlighted uh, difference between them was this one called apoptosis, which um, I still need to do more uh, digging in the literature, but Apoptosis is, a, is essentially programmed cell death. So that's telling uh, the body to uh, kill off uh, cells. And so this being triggered right before they spawn seems concerning um, and maybe connected to egg atresia, oocyte or egg atresia, which is where you find dead eggs essentially. And although I've only seen a few in the histopathology, we only look at a couple uh, slices of that giant uh, gonad. So, and they're only five, 10 microns thick. So we're only looking at a millionth of the size of the actual ovary. And so maybe um, this is something to look more into. So very interesting to see these types of findings um, come together. Um, I also looked at uh, sex steroids, so estradiol and testosterone in the plasma. And this uh, table just shows all of the fish that all the seasons, as well as the rivers and the fish that I uh, analyzed for sex steroids. Um, and to give you a bit of a summary for testosterone, you can see uh, Chop Tank, Severin, Matter Woman in that order um, on uh, for each of the bars. Um, and in February, we saw a significant difference between Chop Tank and Severin. Um, in March, we saw a significant difference between Chop Tank and Severin again, which could be important because testosterone is uh, known to increase dramatically right uh, before the spawn to help uh, uh, start that final maturation and, final, and where the eggs uh, hydrate and prepared to actually be spawned into nature. Um, so having that lower testosterone could be indicative of something. Although in the second uh, year in March, 2019, we did not see a significant difference. So it's hard to say. Um, so connecting that with some of the genetics might help, but I didn't have that genetic component in March, 2018, unfortunately. Um, going on to estradiol, we uh, don't see significant differences between Chop Tank and Severin right on the spawn in 2018, um, but you do between Matter Woman and Chop Tank. Uh, I haven't analyzed Matter Woman as much because we have fewer samples overall for the, for the spawn aspect, but uh, that's something I'm still looking into. 
And but then for March 2019, we do see a significant difference um, with uh, estradiol being lower, um, which may be indicative. But really, what seems to matter to a big degree is the ratio of these two because they kind of counteract each other in a lot of ways. And when you look at that, we don't see these differences except for in December. And that's only between uh, the Severn River and Mattawoman. So it's hard to say how important or how, uh, yeah, how contributive those, uh, the testosterone being lower in March of 2018 is based off of when you look at the ratio. And that's still something I'm trying to finalize. Um, for the last uh, several weeks, I've been uh, taking photos and measuring um, all of these O sites. Uh, I've been looking at about 48 O sites per individual on the spawn to see if the diameter of the, the entire diameter is different, which it turns out the chop tank eggs are smaller than the Severn eggs, um, which you would think a larger egg and uh, looking at the next graph, a larger yolk within the egg would both be good for spawning. So these kind of fly in the face of the idea that the Severn fish uh, eggs are, um, are compromised in some way, but that doesn't mean that they don't show those abnormalities, which we're still finalizing that data on. So the eggs are a different size, but does the, are the abnormalities still shown because those might be more important than the egg size themselves. But it is interesting to actually like have a, some metrics on that. And then that final graph is uh, the average zone of pellucida width. And that's the essentially the egg shell that I was talking about earlier that coats the egg. Um, so those weren't different, which is good because that's a protective coating essentially. These are just a couple photos I pulled off. The left one is, those are largely great looking eggs with, uh, uh, with based off the yolk being very consistent um, and solidified, like you want that um, right before they're going to spawn. The one on the right could be a bit concerning the yolk in the center um, around the germinal vesicle, that white spot in the middle. It has uh, a bit of colored, discoloration. And I have other examples that are probably better, um, but these are things that could show that, that the yolk isn't properly forming. So maybe even though the, the eggs are on average larger, they might not be uh, ready to be fertilized at that exact moment when they're spawned. And that since they spawn within a week, sometimes two weeks, but often very rapidly, um, they have a short window um, that they need to be absolutely ready for fertilization. Um, so that's something we're looking into. We also looked at contaminants. Um, I'm still trying to go through that data and finalize it too. It's a lot, um, but we, we did go and we uh, put out passive samplers in February through March. Um, and so this was out there for a month and these are to simulate animals essentially some of them are fat-like, so what would be absorbed into the fat, um, like the compounds that are concerning with orca whales and stuff, PCBs and PBDEs, flame retardants and other things. Um, and then we have uh, another type of sampler that picks up stuff that's soluble in the water, so not attracted to fat. And so those would be things more like pharmaceuticals and other and pesticides and stuff like that. Um, and these are just some images to kind of give you an idea of what they look like. Um, and we did a small pilot hatching study. Um, Fred Pinkney shown here um, on the Severn River. We went out and as soon as the eggs were spawned, we went and tried to collect three egg chains from each of the rivers um, and get them to a hatchery. Um, we didn't know like how well they were fertilized or anything like that because that was all done by nature. Um, but we brought them in and, uh, and here's another photo just to give you an idea of that egg chain and how it uh, unfolds. The biggest thing is, is we got all these eggs, we put them into raceways so where water's flowing 
it wasn't highly controlled because we didn't have the space at the hatchery available to do a highly controlled study. So we had three egg chains per uh, raceway. And while we got a lot of hatch, um, we didn't follow them too long to see about larval survival and, ju and into juvenile because we just couldn't use their space for that long. Um, so that's an important thing to know. It was only three egg chains and we couldn't properly quantify, but on the bright side, it wasn't like none of the eggs were hatching in the Severn River or in Matter Woman. They all seem to have a good number. It's like there's thousands that some of these egg chains can be 20 to 50,000 eggs. So it's hard to say what is a good number based off of when you're looking at it, but there were a lot of uh, larval fish that hatched out of them. Um, so that could say more about the, the habitat available and those things like salinity, which can uh, be detrimental to the eggs, especially when they hatch. And the biggest thing I feel like after doing all of this research and seeing these rivers up close throughout the year for multiple years is uh, the actual uh, habitat changes. So we grabbed these eggs. Um, we spent one day going out to all these different rivers um, to get these eggs immediately because a major storm was coming through. And if anyone knows the East Coast, the storms are like serious and rapid compared to most of the storms on the West Coast. So um, I went out to some of these uh, rivers after the rainstorm and most of these egg chains we couldn't find. So as much as hatching might be an issue and contaminants might be an issue and all these other aspects, I think that the flow of the river, those hydrology related things, having trees in the river, having things to slow the water flow could be more consequential than anything else, um, which altogether really hampers the fish to have much of a chance. And that's what, one reason why um, there's a hypothesis that the fish come from the eastern shore or from the upper bay for more healthy populations. And that's why we still have fish in these rivers because they're moving in um, each year during like major rainstorms um, because they can't really handle a lot of salinity otherwise. Um, so that's why the hope is, is while I'm here at USGS um, over this summer that I'll be able to conduct a population genetic study with some of the samples I have to look at are the populations in the Severn River related to the ones in Mattawoman Creek or are they related to the ones in Chop Tank? Because if they're not related to these different rivers and we have two others, then that has huge implications for management because it does mean that they could get wiped out if they're not uh, taken care of um, over the next several years. So it's something that uh, I feel like will help this research come together. And honestly, a lot of these things, the, a lot of the tools that we use like transcriptomics are very experimental in the sense that I have to convert a lot of these to like human related genes because you just can't do like that pathway analysis with fish genes. They just haven't developed the databases. So not everything is perfect for that. Um, and a lot of them, I can't find out what they actually are. You know, they have not been characterized yet. So some of the genes um, just might be really important, but I just can't tell you if that's the case. In years from now, we might have that data and you could reanalyze it and get all this information. But at this moment, we're still in the early stages of uh, genomics and doing this. So. Um, I've learned a lot. I've done a lot of programming that I never thought I'd do. Um, a lot of field work, a lot of lab work. Um, so it's been really gratifying. But to give you a straight up answer about the condition is still difficult to say, unfortunately. Um, I want to acknowledge all of these people, Dr. Vicki Blazer and Heather Walsh, among others at USGS, um, Dr. Fred Pinckney at US Fish and Wildlife Service, Steve Minikin, Josh Newhard, Mike Manigold, also at U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They help conduct all of the fishing. Um, Dr. Natalie Karuna Rainier and Sandy Schultz, which who taught me how to extract DNA, how to do uh, PCR, how to do everything I know that way. I'd only learned in 
lectures otherwise. So I had never put it to the test. So very uh, huge thanks to them, as well as I did all my hormone assays there, all the estradiol and testosterone, and they were integral to that. Um, I want to thank Dr. Justin Greer at USGS in Seattle. He's helped me with the with the bioinformatics side of it, um, trying to really uh, make sure my code is up to par. Um, Marilyn C. Grant, who gave me a grant one of these this last year, um, which helped a lot get me through uh, a lot of the research. And then Margaret McGinty and Jim Uphoff and Mark Matchy out at Maryland DNR, um, who I also who have been part of. Um, the Yellow Perch Project since the beginning um, for a very long time. So all important people here, and I could not have done any of this research without all of them together. And of course, the Department of Environmental Science and Technology and the university overall, who's also given grants and other aspects to help contribute TA shifts and other things. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, I hope I didn't ramble too much, and I hope that was interesting. And I will take any questions. Thank you. Awesome, Alex. Well, thank you for a really cool presentation. And uh, I'm very appreciative of you sharing your story because I think often people think that there's kind of one path. And, uh, and I know you and I have talked before that there's definitely more than one path to take uh, in life. So that was great. Um, so I would encourage people if they do have a couple questions to put in um, to the chat, that would be great. And um, why I'm waiting for that, I had a question. You mm -hmm. hit upon it a little bit um, about, you know, like I, I was curious about your, you know, your transcriptomics work and the ability. I know that, you know, it's really hampered us um, in the microbial side as well. Just the databases aren't up to par. Um, and I had a thought as we were going through, like, what is, I mean, are there fish models um, that people are, um, you know, have used that gives you some of that or, or is, or is that not really the case at all? So for like the annotation aspect for like figuring out what genes are what, there is a good amount for like zebra fish, that's a model okay. species. So like that mouse and human, you can get a lot of stuff, but they don't really have it fully developed to the point of doing this uh, intense pathway analyses. That's where I really have to uh, go to the human side. Luckily, uh, genome was published just this last couple of years for yellow perch, so I was able to work off of a full genome. Uh, I would say like for that ovary stuff that I did in the spring, by, by doing just certain different aspects, by doing like the straight bioinformatics flow, I couldn't get the name for a lot of them. I had to dig in because the names are different and stuff. So I had to dig in and look up a lot of those genes individually to annotate them, which is a lot of time. But I felt like for certain time points, I would put in that extra effort of investigating every single gene. Um, but like for the liver, which I haven't fully finished that I have like 3000 genes that are significantly up or down regulated. That's kind of where I have to work in the bioinformatics flow and those that don't get annotated just don't get included unfortunately because it's I just can't see another way to uh to do it in a timely fashion so yeah. it's remarkable though for the ovary spending all that time I think out of like the 300 plus genes only like three of them I couldn't find an annotation um so if you put in the time you can usually find them but you might have to go through like uh, searching that genetic code against databases to see, oh, it actually does line up with something, even though my database says that it doesn't. So yeah, it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah, and, no, uh, that, that, yeah. yeah. It, and unfortunately rings far too true. And, you know, it's something that, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be years, right? Before yeah, we're I thought able to do going that. into this, I was like, oh, we've already figured out all of this and as soon as I dug into it I was like oh my god we don't know that much <laughs> and let's yeah. see so there was one question um that came up do certain stresses stressors emerge as predominant um for yellow per tree production it's uh it's honestly hard to say because abnormality wise and stuff we didn't I haven't seen the which is a good thing. I haven't seen that thin uh, zona pellucida, the eggshell with the abnormalities 
across any of my sites to the severity that was shown in 2007 and 2009. So that's one good thing. So they either the fish I sampled or whatnot just didn't have that same severity. The yolk issue I have seen, but still not quite to the same severity. Um, so it's hard to say if they are still facing these same uh, issues. They might be improved for who knows why. Um, it's hard to say. That's why I really want to look at the population aspect to know if these fish are born and reside in the same stream their whole life, which is what everyone uh, based off of their life history, they spawn upstream, they go down into the estuary, but they don't really go into the bay because the salinity is too high for the most part, except for major rainstorms, which could dilute it more. So they're really constricted to each bay, which in initially was like, well, this is a perfect thing for a field work uh, design because this one segregated from this one and they've been uh, marinating in all these whatever contaminants or whatnot. Um, and they only had like the habitat and food available in that stream or in that river available. Um, so it seemed like it would be good, but it gets much more muddy when I got into everything. And at those earlier stages um, of the whole gonad, gonadal recrudescence, we just don't, see, I haven't seen uh, anything that was alarming. Everything looked pretty good. So it's really only right before they're spawning, which really is when the critical stages happen that I was seeing differences. So I can't say for sure right now. But come to my dissertation defense yet to be announced in the next several months sometime when I have uh, sorted through more of the data and maybe I'll be able to give you a better answer than right now. <laughs> Unfortunate. <laughs> I know. I wanted to. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, I think the, the last question that was on the chat is probably directed at uh, Lance because Fred is <laughs> asking about setting up another fishery study <laughs> for next oh. <laughs> But he says not Alex. So, so. <laughs> Um, yes, please yeah. no. <laughs> I notice it's in all caps too. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something urgent. Yeah. So I think we'll end there for today. Thanks again for a really interesting talk. Um, some really, I, I actually also really like the historic pictures. It was kind of amazing to see some of the um, see some of those pictures. Those are uh, pretty pretty incredible to think that that was within people's lifetimes of that change happened so yeah no it's yeah. incredible and like thanks to Maryland DNR for like putting those out there just because like they've been tracking these populations this whole time and and the Severn like I said we used to be the major hatchery area for the region until the populations just until the eggs just weren't hatching in there so it's, it's alarming to see that. So they are definitely also very interested in my research and I've been asking for an answer and I'm like, I just don't know yet, but I hope that I do get, have something to say other than change up the ha habitat, you know, those environmental factors outside of contaminants, even though that's my specialty, <laughs> you know, yeah. have to look at the bigger picture, not just get too focused on your own. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good lesson for all, all of us. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll encourage everybody that's still on also to please fill out an evaluation for Alex. Um, and um, we'll finish there and please join us next week when um, we have Oh shoot! I knew who it Taylor. was. Taylor. Taylor. Thank you, Taylor. I I looked it up earlier. I knew it was okay. Taylor will be presenting out of uh, from uh, Dr. Torres' lab. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh,